In the early 90s, the gaming revolution was happening all around the world, and the Nintendo 64 contributed to the massive 3D outburst that happened in the mid-90s. The Nintendo 64 was a revolutionary console, and despite some of the challenges to program for the device, and some of the quirks and features that the system had, it was a legendary console and made some of the best games in history. When you're designing a console, probably one of the most important aspects of it is how a player can control whatever the game is on screen, and with a console, you have a specific set of hardware, and how the player interacts with that hardware is extremely important. So a controller design is essential to making a great game system. And the Nintendo 64 is no different. The controller played a huge part in the game's design. In fact, Super Mario 64 was designed in tandem with the N64 controller. And it's not to say that Super Mario 64 influenced the design of the controller, but rather the other way around. What felt good with the controller played better to the game's strengths, and Shigeru Miyamoto was very involved with this. But one thing is for certain that we can say about this controller design, it was space age and unique. It was something new, and Nintendo really took a big swing at this one, but how did it fare? And if we look at game consoles now, other than apart from the Switch of course, with the Xbox and the PlayStation, they follow the same two-pronged, two-analog-stick approach that the PlayStation 1 originally had came around to after about a year or so of release. That same feel, with subtle changes here and there, have served gamers well now for the better of 20 years. So did Nintendo strike out with this design? I don't think they did, and while the reviews of these controllers can be mixed, I think that this was an excellent use of technology for the time, and Nintendo's R&D 3 team certainly put a lot of work and Nintendo dumped a lot of money into this. Let's talk through this controller design and take a look at the brains of it and see if we can make sense of it. Hi everybody, I'm James from Cycle Studios, and today we're going to be talking about the Nintendo 64 controller. So if we think about how best an actor can assert an action into a specific game on a console, we have to understand how we can get data from one spot to another, and in this case from the user onto the game console so the game can update accordingly. And back when the 64 was designed, you had a couple of options. If you think about designs today, most controllers are communicating through some type of RF communication protocol. And while the technology was around back this time to do this whole dance, Circuitry was much more expensive in order to design robustly, EMC requirements were much more expensive to fulfill uh, you know, all around the world, and also, the scale at which Nintendo wanted to produce these controllers and sell them at the margins they did, the price point just simply wasn't there, and neither was the size factor. So, at this time, you were pretty much stuck to doing wired communication. Now, on a fundamental level, when we're talking about wired communication, you essentially have to have some type of electrical signal that gets pulled from logical high to logical low in a sequence that represents some type of information. And in this case, what we end up doing is we take a voltage threshold, in some cases it's different values, but let's say over one and a half volts is logical one, anything over that is one, and anything underneath it is zero. So if we have electrical circuitry that can pull lines high and low in a specific sequence, we can put together some type of data or information. And the circuits and design or standards at which these circuits operate is called serial communication. And serial communication allows you to send data back and forth across a wire in order to convey messages. And the benefit to this is that it's an extremely controlled environment and you can use it pretty much anywhere. In the Nintendo 64's case, the use case of this yielded for some type of UART known as Universal Asynchronous Receive and Transmit. If we notice and look at the controller connector on the N64, there are three pins. One goes to voltage, one goes to ground, and the other is the signal line. And the signal line acts as both the transmit and the receive, known as half duplex UR. If we're talking on the hardware level, the console pulls the line high, and it never actually will pull the line up to 3.3, the controller will always pull the line down and the line is set high to begin with, and this is very common with UART interfaces. But the way this works is pretty simple. There's a host microcontroller on the controller, and the controller will sample each of the hardware inputs, whether they're buttons or the control stick or something like that. And once this happens, there's some latency in between the hardware RC constant that the lines are read in on the microcontroller and sampled, and then time for the communication module on the micro of the 
controller itself to transmit it over the wire. After all the sampling is done and the data is packaged together, something called a CRC is calculated. And a CRC is basically a checksum to verify that the data is the same when the controller sampled it at the point that the console processes it after it's sent over the wire. A lot can happen between the host processor sending it to the console on the wire due to noise and interference so we don't want any erroneous input we don't want buttons being pressed when they shouldn't be so this is what the crc is for is to prevent that from happening the way a console like the N64 should handle some type of serial message would be as follows. If there's some type of real-time operating system, which there is on the N64, typically there's something called preemptive scheduling, and preemptive scheduling allows for threads to spin up when new things come in uh, from hardware. So in this case, it would be an interrupt generated from the communication line that's being sent. If the CRC checks out on the console side, an interrupt fires, and a message queue is invoked to transfer the data from one thread to another, basically saying, hey, there's data ready, there's new controller data ready to be taken. And once that controller data is ready to be taken, using a message queue, we can now say, okay, we can now process this data because we know that it's checked out the CRC and the operating system has let us know that new data is ready in the queue. It's very typical in serial communication protocols that there's something called control bytes. And basically, once you set up your header to the point where, okay, there's an attention byte saying, hey, I have a message for you, followed by a command byte or some type of control byte, it tells what the uh, processor to do. And this case is no different. So the N64's frame table for the controller is laid out as follows. Hex values 0 through 3 handle a number of things. The first one, which would be 00, basically has three bytes to identify what the controller is and what is attached to the controller and if there is a CRC error inside of the double EEPROM of a controller pack. For 01, we have all the controller data. It essentially sends back a 32-bit value of what bits are set, meaning what buttons have been pressed, and also a couple of bytes to determine control stick coordinates. Hex 2 is a read command from the double EEPROM of the controller pack, whereas Hex 3 is a write command to the double EEPROM of the controller pack. And there's also one last feature here inside the frame table from FF, and FF is a joystick calibration mode. So in production, since the N64's joystick uses optical sentry, to determine where the joystick is positioned, you don't know the starting point, so it needs to be seated somehow. In production, this would be sent to the controllers to essentially tell it where to begin, and from that point, it would be able to determine its position from then on. The controller memory space is aligned on 32-byte boundaries, and they essentially have 32 kilobytes of space. Rumble packs work similar. Since the 2-byte value, or the unsigned 16-bit integer, could go up to 64K, 32 kilobytes was left free. So this means that the 32K above that, you could address sector based on these 32-byte offsets on how to turn a rumble pack on and off. And this allowed for more than just that as well. So you could do more things if there were different peripherals, but very few of them existed. So that breaks down the system level overview of the Nintendo 64 controller interface, and I'd like to do more videos on this in the future if you guys want, so please let me know in the comments below if you want to hear the more detailed solutions to both sides of the equation here, whether it's on the console side or whether it's on the controller side. I want to thank everybody for stopping by this video and watching it. Be sure to like it if you did. And also drop in the comments some suggestions on future content. I'd love to hear from you guys, and I hope to see you all in the next video. This is James from Cycle Studios, signing off.